Good afternoon and welcome to the latest in our series of live webinars brought to you by the HOP platform. So HOP is a website that we hope every school in Hertfordshire is using and aware of. So HOP stands for the Hertfordshire Opportunities Portal. It is a careers guidance resource for you. So everything you want to know about where the jobs are in Hertfordshire, um, where there are apprenticeships, what courses are available, how you go out for applying, what our big sectors and industries are in the county can all be found on HOP. You may be using it in school or college at the moment. If you're not, do have a look at it. It's not just the website, it's also our social media handles, which you'll see on the screen at the moment. And you'll possibly see, depending on whether I sway left or right, uh, you may see them on those screens behind me. Um, one of the features on the HOP are these careers webinars. So we've been running these since May 2020. Every week we pick a different theme and we ask a panel of experts to come together and to share their experiences and knowledge of that particular industry to help inform you possibly about what your next GCSEs or A-levels or college courses might be or perhaps even looking on slightly beyond that. So today the focus of our webinar is going to be about careers as a personal trainer. I've got three fantastic panelists to introduce to you very shortly who are going to tell you a little bit about them and what they can inform you about today. But a bit of housekeeping first of all. For those of you watching live, it's 4.30 on a Thursday afternoon. So firstly, thank you so much for registering to come and attend this webinar and for coming in from school or college and for logging into the webinar. We hope you'll find this next hour or so really, really beneficial. Um, you do have the opportunity, if you're watching live, to submit your own questions. So I know a couple of you submitted questions when you registered and we'll come on to those. Um, but if you do want to ask a question, you haven't got to say it out loud. You haven't got, even got to type it so that everyone can see it. Um, on the dashboard in front of you, and you're probably using this uh, GoToWebinar software for the first time today, but on your dashboard, you'll see that there's a questions tab. So if you click on that, open it out, it'll open out a text box. You can type your question in there. It will come through. It's only visible to me. And then I will direct that question to well, whichever of our panelists you want to direct that question to. So do make the most of this opportunity. You, you, so you can interact with our, with our panelists. We've some, assigned some time at the end of the webinar for you to ask your own questions. Um, the session is being recorded. So if you can't stay for us all the way through, uh, then it will be on the HOP platform from tomorrow. Um, equally, if you know of any of your family or friends who perhaps would really have benefited from watching this, you can tell them about it, they can watch it back and you can find access to all the previous webinars that we've run in the past. There's, I think there's over 70 of them now, so hopefully there is literally something for everyone on there. We'll definitely find a career that will be of interest to you. Um, first of all though, let's introduce our panelists. So I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves in turn, then we'll come back and we'll find out a little bit more about their careers. So first of all, um, in no particular order, I'm gonna say very good afternoon to Michelle. Michelle, Michelle, thank you for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about the role that you do at the moment? Thanks, Gareth. Yeah, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Michelle. I am the Sport and Physical Activity Skills Hub Manager for SIMSPA. Um, so that's the Chartered Institute for Management of Sport and Physical Activity. And I cover Hertfordshire, Buckinghamshire, Berkshire and Oxfordshire. Thanks, Michelle. And very good afternoon to Chris. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Chris Fennell. I'm the Workforce Development Officer for the Heart Sport and Physical Activity Partnership, and I'm based at the University of Hertfordshire at the de Havilland campus. Thanks, Chris, and uh, delighted to welcome Nick to the webinar. Good afternoon, Nick. Thanks, Gareth, and afternoon, everyone. Yeah, uh, Nick Bishop, so uh, Assistant Fitness Manager at Hertfordshire Sports Village, um, where I started as a health and fitness coach originally back in 2003, um, and alongside my role, uh, get to do some personal training um, as a sideline as well. So, Sure, okay, thank you for those introductions. So so Nick is perhaps most directly in the cold face here, is that he has been a, a, you know, a personal trainer, it's his main role, does it a little bit now, but I guess also you work with a team of personal trainers, don't you, at the Sports Village? I so, do. You can tell us a little bit about what the role really entails on a day-to-day -day basis and what you would look for in a prospective personal trainer, which perhaps our audience today may well be part of. Uh, but Chris and Michelle, I think I think going to talk slightly more generally about the sports and physical activity industry within Hertfordshire and how personal trainers fit into that. So, Chris, you prepared a, um, a slide for me, which hopefully is up on visible on screen at the moment. Um, and that's just going to explain a little bit about the context about the different roles and how personal trainers fit into this. So the, the floor is yours just to talk us through this slide. 
Well, hopefully everybody can see the slide and this represents how, you know, the sport and physical activity landscape has been laid out. Um, up in the top left hand corner, you've got local authorities that run leisure centres, sports centres and swimming pools. You've got universities and colleges um, that have big sports centres these days. You've then got the private gyms like David Lloyd and Virgin Active. You've then got elite sport, which are linked to the national governing bodies, and it could be cricket, swimming or tennis. Um, you've then got the active partnerships um, that exist, and there are 43 of them across the country, alongside national governing bodies and small um, and medium-sized enterprises, all of which have a, have a need for a workforce to deliver you know, a, a coaching function that could well be within the physical and, and personal training um, perspective. So this gives the learners an, an idea of it's not just about being in the leisure centre or the local park. There are, you know, a variety of um, environments, employers and settings that um, people could find themselves working in at some point in the future. A big area for development recently is the, um, the ageing population and the amount of physical activity taking place in sheltered housing and daycare services that I think is, will, be, will be a really important um, aspect of our sector going forward. Sure, thanks, Chris. And I think it's a, it's a really good introduction. It's a really important point to make as well. That many of you that are watching this may have your, you know, your heart set on being a personal trainer, and you know, hopefully, most of you will do that, and it will be the right role for you. And certainly, Nick will want to make sure that you really talented people, can, you know, come to him. Um, but equally, personal trainer might be what you're thinking about at the moment. But it may be through something that you hear today or over the next couple of years makes you think, well, yeah, I'm kind of interested in personal training. But some of the other things that I've heard about are of interest to me as well, that are that are related. So, um, Nick, I, look, I'm going to come to you first of all, because I, I think what we should perhaps try and do is define what a personal trainer is. So people may have had a personal trainer or may already work with a personal trainer. They, they may know someone who is or it may just yeah. be a bit of a sort of an abstract sort of concept to them. So can you explain sure. essentially what does a personal trainer do? Yeah, I mean, essentially, from, from my experience, I started out as a, as a health and fitness coach first, working one to one with people in small groups. Um, and really discovered that I really enjoyed that side of the work um, and wanted to kind of, you know, further my own ambitions, wanted to get further training. Um, so I looked, I, I did my level two gym instructor qualification first, which was my uh, first step. Um, then went on to do my level three personal trainer qualification after that, which, which kind of qualified me to work one-to-one -one with people, um, give them some nutritional advice and actually really drill down on what their hobbies and interests were, why they were coming for a personal trainer. Was it a lack of motivation in the gym? You know, was it someone they needed to keep them focused um, and actually, you know, work work with them to a, a set some achievable goals um, and actually ease them through their workouts um, and make sure that they make sure they attend the gym on a regular basis. That that was that was what really attracted me to it. Um, like to be able to see people develop as well. Um, be able to give them a little nudge, give them a little bit of um, motivation when they need it, when they're struggling, um, and you know, to see people hit their targets. That's um, that's really the, the driving force for for myself, really. Okay, well, let's talk about the, the physical environment of being a, a personal trainer. Are all personal trainers yeah. based in gyms like you're one at the Hertfordshire Sports Village, or where? What other settings might they find themselves in? Yeah, no, I mean, it can be quite diverse. Um, going back quite a few years, I, I used to work in a small private facility where we've got a lot of um, well-paying customers. But uh, to spread the net a bit wider, personal trainers can work in an outdoor setting. They can do um, kind of park environments, work in healthcare settings, in in care homes. There's a lot of different environments just other than the gym that where I um, where I came to the sports village here. Um, so the background can be quite varied. Um, working in people's homes as well, you know, because so being mobile, having all of your own equipment, um, being able to get to where people live, um, and also not excluding the workplace as well. I've actually trained people um, in their workplace as well, believe it or not. Okay. And any any preference for you? Do you like being outdoors? Do you like being in the gym, or do you like being able to sort of travel to different places? Yeah, I mean, I, I quite like the variety, if I'm if I'm completely honest. I, I, I have to say I do like working in an outdoor environment. There's been a lot of focus on uh, boot camps are very much in focus at the moment. There's been a lot of focus and interest around boot camps in, in, in local parks and things of that nature. Um, so if, you know, if you've got the opportunity to take it outside, 
you know, make use of the good physical environment, um, then yeah, I'm, I'm certainly open to that and, and try and use that as much as we can uh, for the right clients. Sure, and I mean, just in terms of, Sorry, oh, go on, Chris. Well, yeah. Because of COVID, the amount of people who, who are now delivering content online, yeah, you know, from a PT perspective, means that you haven't got to find yourself to get into the gym for four o'clock. You can book yeah. your session during your lunchtime online with your PT and they can yeah. motivate you and deliver that session online. So that remote learning is something that's really accelerated on the back of COVID and, the, and all the lockdowns. So I think that there is a very much a hybrid approach now and there is an awful lot of online PT coaching offering nutrition advice, lifestyle advice and those coaching sessions. And while some of them might be on a one-to-one -one basis and face-to-face, some of them could well be you know in that online environment and that's more desirable for people to be especially if they're if they're time poor yeah and, and and that's certainly true of us you know going back to 2020 we had to um push all of our work to that online portal um and we were literally when we were at home we were actually delivering sessions from from our lounges from our living room sometimes having to move the furniture out the way which is a bit of an experience um, but we've, we've kept that online platform because people have told us that they they really respond to that. And like you say, when they're time poor, sessions are recorded uh, so that people are able to dip in and dip out of those for a time that suits them. Um, so certainly during COVID, it had its place. But even now, people are still really open to to wanting to use the online portal as well. Sure, <laughs> Nick, let, let's sort of create a bit of a situation here. And I'll just so you yeah. can let everyone in. To, to the world of a personal trainer. So I go into your, your gym at the Hertfordshire Sports Village. And yeah. um, well, first of all, all the people that work in there, are they all personal trainers? Are they gym instructors? Are the two terms used interchangeably? Yeah, so we, we, we've got quite a flexible model here. So all of our staff are fitness coaches. So what they do, if they choose to, they can run their personal training business alongside their health and fitness coach roles. Um, also, to supplement that, we've got uh, some self-employed PTs as well who are rent paying. So they, they pay their rent on a monthly basis and then they're able to then use the gym floor as their, as their opportunity, if you like, to go up to members, to approach them, canvas opinion and see if they can actually turn gym members into their own PT clients. All right. So we have a, we have a, we have a license to be a little bit flexible on that, but mo most of the guys and girls that work for us take up the opportunity to do some personal training. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so I'm I'm a regular in your gym then, and then yeah. I'm really you know undisciplined. I don't really know how I'm using what I'm using the machines for. I'm a bit of a scattergun approach to 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 fitness. Um, and I talked sure. to you or talked talk to one of your personal trainers and said, look, I'd really like a f personal trainer. What's the first yeah. steps? What's the sort of conversation or dialogue that would happen at that point? Yeah, so we keep it nice and nice and relaxed, nice and friendly. Actually, talk to people about their motivations. What you know, how long they're doing coming to the gym? What is it that, that they're struggling with? What would they like to achieve? And actually, very simply, get the individuals to kind of set their own goals. You know, so can can they achieve one session a week? Can it be two Ooh. sessions a week? And actually, get them to make a time commitment. How much time have they got available? Is it is it going to be an hour a week? Is it more like going to be 45 minutes and actually get with with our input, get the client themselves to set their own goals, something that's realistic. Um, and then obviously, you know, we can talk about, you know, for the um, personal trainer packages that we offer, whether that's going to be block booking sessions. Can they buy five sessions at a time? Can they buy 10 sessions? Try and get some sort of commitment from them. All right, because hopefully they're in it for the long haul rather than just doing one or two sessions. Um, clearly, we're going to take them around the gym, show them the, the equipment, show them the types of things we're going to do, and, and ultimately, get um, can we get a start date in the diary? For sure, for sure. Okay. and then presumably, then you're dealing with a real range of people from from ages and physical ability. So, yeah. what are the most enjoyable parts of the role of a personal trainer, Nick? Um, I think, from my own my own perspective, is to actually see people achieve and actually see people hit their goals. So, you know, we, we spoke about early on where it was they've started, where they want to get to. But along the way, we're putting some in some small measurable steps, some achievable targets that this person can work towards. And when they hit those goals, you can see the, the positivity that it creates within that individual, within that person. So there'd be a case of reanalyzing re their goals, setting some targets for them to um, just look to stretch them a little bit more. Um, 
so yeah, we're seeing seeing people hit their targets, achieve their goals is you know it's got to be the most satisfying thing I would say. For sure. And then I've got to ask the flip question of that is that yeah. what are the challenges with the roles? Of you know, and we very much want to cover warts and all in these these webinars. But yeah. what are the things that maybe people watching this at the moment should be aware of that that maybe people don't know about when they first think about becoming a personal mm. trainer? Yeah, um, we we got to be honest and open when 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 we talk to people. If you you got to get a, a sense of commitment from people, um, and I have to say when it, when it's people that, that cancel on you at the last minute, um, and are not able to to make their sessions. Fair enough, if they got illness, they've got injury, that happens. That's part of life. But you, you're trying to nail on a commitment with someone, so we'll, we'll put in place a cancellation policy as well, so they're absolutely clear from the start. All right, so if they cancel it within 24 hours, that's a, that's a chargeable session. All right, so you're trying to get a sense of ownership of people. They've, they've committed financially. They put dates in the diary. Um, so, yeah, can, cancelling last minute can be, a real, uh, can be a real pain, to be honest. Sure. There's, um, there's a really good question that came in during the registrations, actually. So I'm going to read this out as it is. So how do you develop a client's workout plan? And then the follow-up question was, when is it appropriate to offer nutritional advice? Yeah, sure. So I'll break that down into two parts. So the way, obviously, you start with where what they've done to start with. So where, where are they at? Where's their baseline? Check out their fitness levels. What is it they're working with? What is it they're finding hard? And see if we can, is it more a strength-based goal? Is it more cardiovascular? Can we put in two sides of those, both of those components, actually assess where people are at? Okay, um, and, and assess their assess their physical capabilities. You might get into a little fitness test, see how they cope with that, because that that can give us a baseline. And then once they've done that, you know, six to eight weeks down the line, we can reassess that person. Can we measure that improvement? Hopefully, we can, and that will give them a real good sense of achievement. If they've hit that target, they've obviously achieved better from when they started. That that can serve as a real big motivator for them. Um, in terms of nutritional advice as well, it's about getting people to keep a food diary. That's a really good start point for people. Um, and it doesn't be, have to be over seven days as well. We can get people to write down their, their food intake over three days in a week because trying to keep it for seven days is difficult. You know, trying to write down and everything that you've eaten and drunk over seven days, people's memories, you're not, not going to be able to maybe remember everything. Um, and also, do people tell you fibs? Let's be honest. Are, are, are people being honest? You know, if you if you don't eat breakfast, then then let us know that. You know, if there's a big blank space where breakfast should be, then we need to know about that, and we can start to talk about the reasons why that doesn't happen. Uh, what are the challenges that they're facing, and hopefully put in place some solutions for them. For sure. Okay. Thank, well, look, Nick, I think you've really set the scene nicely of what a personal trainer does and you know, what the really rewarding parts of the role are and perhaps what's slightly more challenging as well. So I'm going to come on to, um, come on to Chris now and just want to find out about what are the sort of qualifications or what are the routes that people need to take to, to go into this industry, Chris? So I guess the, the, you know, the first question is let's think about, um, let's do it stage by stage. Think about someone who's currently in you know, perhaps year eight or nine at school and they're considering which GCSEs they're going to be taking. They've obviously got to take English, maths, and science. Are there yeah. any mandatory subjects that you think someone absolutely must study at GCSE? I'm, I'm thinking typically sort of PE is the is the obvious optional one here. Yeah, I think PE is a big one. Um, I'd also talk about media studies because clearly, if you own business, you need to have your digital marketing skills. Um, you know, as a self-employed PT, running your own books and having your accountancy is, is quite important. Um, I think the idea of um, having a, a mixed science or a biology or a physics um, that will pick up, you know, and support the PE um, aspects of anatomy, physiology and how the body works and how um, nutrition will help, you know, how the intake of food will help fuel those, those energy bursts required either for a strength and conditioning session or a cardiovascular one. So um, it's not just about PE and games. It, it, it's the wider, how do you market? How do you understand your product? How do you understand your business? Um, and that, you know, that's where economics come in, comes into it there as well. So th there's a wide variety of, of subjects that I'd recommend, but PE is the core one with life sciences, sports studies and um, media studies being sort of the wraparound aspect. But I think there are other places 
alongside the school environment where the learners can go to to pick up some information about how they develop their careers and that's where Michelle and Simsper's role come in because they're, they're, a lot of their work is targeted at the sole traders or people who work on them by themselves and how they can support them if they're not part of a larger organisation and I think that's quite key. Sure. Okay. So, Chris, you're saying there that you know PE, you know, very, very good subject to do. Now, of course, Michelle, not every school will offer PE as a GCSE subject. I think probably most do, but not, but not all of them do. Um, so, is it essential, or do you think it's just desirable? And if it, if it's not a subject you, you're actually able to take, um, are there, are there, are there other ways that you can gain that knowledge that might lead you down the right route? Yeah. No. Definitely. Um, so, I mean, obviously, it's. Um, would it be beneficial um i wouldn't i wouldn't go as far as saying you couldn't be a pt if you didn't take pe uh, it definitely would help obviously they talk about anatomy physiology um the bones the muscles and all of that kind of stuff when you're doing your pe gcse so that stuff will come up when you do your level two gym instructor and your level three and you go quite in into depth about it um but also things change like we said your option you don't need to pick everything right now that you're doing in your life and it's kind of do that or, or else so it, I, I changed I, I was kind of a gym instructor a lifeguard um I've been a I thought I was going to be a PE teacher um that kind of changed and I worked for a kind of um a sports partnership I've worked with NGBs and now I'm here at Simsfer so don't worry you don't <laughs> is, is my kind of advice um but definitely kind of obviously taking PE does help um, but there's other options I mean obviously if you was to go to college there's kind of obviously BTEC there's subjects that you can take which will support that um, and then obviously if you go to university um, there are options out there and obviously like I said when you're on the level two and level three courses they do kind of go through that anyways um, but it definitely helps but I wouldn't say it's not kind of the be all and end all if, if you didn't and you changed your mind when you were later in life. Sure then Michelle let me ask you another question just going perhaps step beyond GCSEs and okay. going, to, going to college is having a degree going to be beneficial for someone and if so what sort of what things should people consider when they're choosing a degree if this is an industry that they want to go into? Yeah, I mean, you're probably hearing a lot lots about it where we've got older siblings and, and cousins and things like that. And it's not essential. Again, um, again, this is my advice. So any any kind of opposing opinions, <laughs> um, but it, it does help. I mean, it depends, again, what what subject you want to take. So if you want to go into sport and physical education, sport science, sport coaching, there's kind of different routes you can take. Um, a lot of universities now are adding on courses like level two gym instructor, level three PT, so that you could either get a part-time job while you're studying, studying at university. And also when you finish, you can then go straight into employment, which is amazing. Um, so if it's something that you're not sure about, but you kind of want to do it as well, or, or you, the, the options are there. So you could, I'm sure you could be studying kind of anything else at university if you were studying English and then the, the university had those courses on, you could still kind of sign up to them. Um, but there's, there's lots of options out there. There's private kind of independent training providers in Hertfordshire Study Active. So again, if you're not at university and there's other options to be able to sign up to, to do these courses, um, there's lots of options online now. Um, so you've got kind of Active IQ, YMCA, Future Fit. Um, lots of leisure centres um, deliver them themselves independently. So th there's lots of options. Um, it just depends what your passion is. I think university is a, yeah, it just depends your route. I mean, you're going to be studying for three years, so you need to be passionate about it. So if you're 100% know that sport and physical activity is, is, is what you want to do, then I would say absolutely go for it. Um, but if you're not, if you're not sure, then spending three years <laughs> and getting into what is it now 30 grand worth of debt and um, there's other options as apprenticeships and things like that so that you can get your qualifications so just yeah ha have a chat um but like i said you can always change your your career um kind of later down the line as well sure well, thank okay. you thing I'd say is that the, the university of hertfordshire is one of the re um, first um, universities in the country to do a degree apprenticeship in sports management so that's something if the learners are listening and are interested to check out the the, the degree apprenticeship 
um, uh, at the university on their website. The other aspect to recognise is that once you qualify as a PT, there's an awful lot of bolt-on courses and additional learning that you can that you can have, whether that's being exercise to music, working with different populations, whether they be older adults, younger adults, people who've had a cardiac episode, people who've had a stroke, or you know, so there was there were a number of additional learning and see continued professional development modules that that most PTs do to have that broad range of offer so when you're working with your clients and these clients could be from 16 to 95 you're able to cater to their needs and it's not just about the strength and conditioning and being able to write a program you wrap that around with um, exercise strength conditioning um, nutrition the psychological aspect to it and also mindfulness is playing a real big part now in in how people spend their time and and work through those those quieter sessions where it hasn't got to be high intensity as well sure okay um chris you you, you touched on there about the degree of apprenticeships um what about apprenticeships in general is it as an industry and thinking specifically about pts are there good apprenticeship programs at perhaps level two or three that people should be aware of yeah i, mean, I think there are apprenticeships available now um being pushed out via the colleges and a number of employers are taking on um, students and learners to, to, to join that pathway um, and they are, are very much the entry level into the sector um, but once you're within an organization you'll find very quickly that that, that employer um, will offer you training opportunities that could take you in all sorts of different di different directions that would enhance your career skills and your ability and your, your employability further on in your, in your career so yeah the, the apprenticeship route is is being favored by um by a lot of employers um within within our sector and it's a really good route to gain on the job training um without having to travel too far and especially if you don't want to go off to university mm -hmm. for sure okay nick let, let me just ask you to, to wrap this section up here so we've spoken about some of the qualifications people will need and qualifications are one thing but ultimately you're employing people so what do you want to see for them? What are the sorts of skills or qualities that someone needs to have as part of their personality to be a really good personal trainer? Absolutely. Uh, I think, you know, really, first and foremost, we're talking about the kind of softer skills, the, the ability that, to have the confidence to go up and approach people, to interact with people, to ask them questions, to, to use lots of kind of open body language, uh, and just to feel at ease with people, really, to have that, have that natural confidence, um, because, you know, clients are going to be out there for you. Uh, to be able to ask people questions, find out some information about them, um, and try and build a bit of rapport with people. You know, have that ability, have that confidence, have a conversation with someone that you that you maybe wouldn't approach under normal circumstances, um, and just just see what you can find out about them. Really, first and foremost. For sure. Okay. Thank you, Rob. We've had another question come in, so it's come from Lily. I'm going to ask it to you, Nick. Um, so, yeah. how do you motivate your clients when they feel as if they are not achieving their goal and want to give up? I think it's a really good question really really good question yeah absolutely it ha happens happens uh, quite a lot um and it's about setting those small achievable targets um you know first and foremost trying to set a session time for when you know they can they can do it so not maybe doing it first thing in the morning if they've got to get ready for work they've got to get the kids up for school try and get them to look at their diaries and actually first and foremost get a time in the diary that's going to work for them OK, so they've got a good chance of actually being able to come and come and see you. Um, and as I say, set some more small achievable targets, make the session fun as well. OK, do something different. Ask them what they'd actually like to do to the session. Rather than you always leading a session, is there a particular focus that they'd like to focus on? Make, make the session a little bit more about them, OK, rather than you leading the session with what you want to do. So um, yeah, get, get a little bit of involvement from them too. For sure. Thank you. Thank you for that question. If you do want to ask questions, if you're watching this live, um, just go into the questions tab. Um, it opens out a text box. Type your question and it comes through only visible to me. Then I'll direct it to our panel. Another question that's come in. I'm going to ask this one to you as well, Nick. Um, yeah. Do you have to be really fit to be a personal trainer? <laughs> uh, it helps. It helps. Um, I think it might. Again, I can only really speak from my own experience. Um, tend to be working with a lot of, de a lot of deconditioned clients. Okay, so the, the chance of having to, you 
being super fit um, isn't really a requirement. You need a good general standard of fitness to be able to, be, to keep pace with people. If you're doing personal training on a regular basis, you know, five days out of seven, then you need a, a good level of fitness for sure. Um, but I wouldn't say you need to be super fit to be a PT. No, not at all. No. Okay. Right. That question was from Jamal. Hopefully that answered that question. Um, Michelle, I just want to come to you now on um, just reassuring everyone that's watching this that they want to become a personal trainer. They may well have got some really good advice from you guys about which courses or subjects they should choose now. But when they come out and they're actually looking for a job, are they going to? Is there going to be a demand for personal trainers in Hertfordshire? Yes. <laughs> yes. So what we're seeing is actually the sport and physical activity sector as a whole um, that there's a huge recruitment drive. Myself and Chris are gathering a lot of kind of hyper local data at the moment, um, and and yeah, they're definitely needed. You'll you'll see kind of all of the independent gyms, the leisure centres are all all recruiting um for kind of whether it's kind of how, how they as nick said that they're kind of set up sometimes differently if they have kind of fitness coaches or fitness instructors or pts um but even if you are a fitness instructor a lot of opportunities to to grow and develop as as chris said as well in terms of um kind of on the job training and and developing whether that's an apprenticeship whether it's paying for cpd and things like that um but in short yes <laughs> um are you going to ask me where to go or should I carry on and where to go? <laughs> no, we'll come back to that one. So I have another question that's come in. Um, now, Michelle, you probably won't be able to answer this one because I know you're not you know, a personal trainer in your day job. But the question is, what's it like to be a female personal trainer? And do you think gender changes anything? Well, let, let me come to you with that question and, and say, presumably, to satisfy your client base, you need yeah. to have female personal trainers as well because I imagine you'll have some clients who would feel far more comfortable working with sure. another Absolutely yeah and, and you're always going to get people that will say quite categorically from the start females with females and, and that's perfectly fine you know you, we, we can cater for that um, so yeah having having the best of both world male and female personal trainers is um, is obviously what, what we have and it, work, it works really well to be honest. Yeah, and from a wider diversity perspective, Chris, is is this an industry that is perhaps finding it challenging to make sure that we've you know we've we've got as many females as males in? I, I think more and more it's becoming uh, it's attractive to both genders, to be honest, because of the flexibility in in the working arrangements. So you know, a leisure centre gym is open from six in the morning till ten at night. You know, so that's that's when you can interact with your clients. So depending on your your gender background or, or you know or what sort of um, you know where you come from and what you're interested in, it, you know th there are a client base that will meet your needs and fulfil those requirements. So I think the the sector is really um, uh, very good in attracting a diverse variety of individuals from different backgrounds who've got a, a passion about sport and physical activity and that will be represented in the workforce and the client base we have. For sure. Michelle, anything that you want to add to that? Yeah, I think it's just, I think definitely in the sector they do need more female, so if that female uh, who answered the question definitely <laughs> get qualified and get in the sector um, so it's, it's just for various reasons like Nick said if it's just personal preference um, some religious backgrounds and kind of um, diversity backgrounds um, and it's just making sure that kind of everyone I guess at Sinspur and it's, I mean locally um, Hertfordshire Sports Partnership in terms of what we want to do is to everyone to have the opportunity to be physically active and if that if that's not possible because of a staff member, then we need to we need to rectify that issue and ensure that everyone has an opportunity to take part in physical activity. So I guess our job is just making sure that there's the right facilities to do that, there's the right workforce to do that, and then there's the right activities taking place in that area for those local people. For sure. OK, thank you. So, well, yeah, the, the original question, we had those two really good ones that came in. So, Chris, let me ask, um, let me ask, ask you this one. Um, what, so someone's a personal trainer, they're perhaps a very good personal trainer. Nick obviously doesn't want to lose his personal trainers, but what are the other routes that someone might then go into? I think as you progress your career, you might find doing some group exercise is a natural add-on to being a personal trainer. 
Um, and that, because there, there were very, there were two routes. There was either a salaried member of staff who was on the gym floor and doing some personal training as part of that process, or you're an independent sole trader and you've got your own company. Um, and it's how you fill those hours of the day. And it could be doing um, group exercise. You know, that this is very, very niche in some of the small studios where you might have two or three tr friends who want to train together and they'll pay for that that quality time with, with the trainer. But also you might branch into yoga. You might want to do exercise to music, exercise to music with water, all of which builds up your business and the hours of the day in which you're working to deliver your, your business product. So, and I think from that, you then might find that you, you take your business forward, you might employ other people then. So you become part of a franchise or you've employed other people who will run sessions for you. So the, 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 the more clients you have and the bigger your business becomes, the more complex the needs are. So therefore you'll need to have a, a booking system where people can book on. And that's when you start talking about having an app and a booking system and whether you pay by direct debit and all those things that, you know, become more more of a requirement as your business and your and your organization grows whereas as a as a standalone pt it is quite it, it is simpler if that makes sense sure well nick i mean do you miss the days when you were say just a personal trainer yeah uh, yeah for sure yeah there, there's a really you build over time you build a really good solid relationship with people you know you get to know about the ins and outs of their lives to tell you everything some of the stuff you do want to know some of the stuff you don't want to know um but but actually you, you you form that that rapport that common ground with people um and also just you know picking up on chris's point you know if you're if you're able to teach classes yeah what i will say is that you know when you walk the gym floor when you're teaching classes to say 15 or 20 people everyone is a potential client you know so to put put yourself in front of that amount of people you know you can actually showcase your talents you can have the conversation with people outside of that class environment but um it's about networking it's about putting yourself in front of people and actually over time you know building a business growing growing your client base and actually ultimately being successful as a pt sure okay okay um we've had another very interesting question from from lily so nick very situational one here yeah. What do you, as a as a personal trainer, suggest for clients that struggle with pain? And are there any pain management ideas? I mean, I'm sure you must have this with clients who will come and say, oh, what yeah. do you, I'd, I'd love to go and do a 3K run, but I've just got this ache in my knees or my back's bad. So how do you yeah, manage yeah. that? Again, it, again, it's about breaking it down. And if people are suffering pains in particular areas of their body, particular joints, can we can we give them some exercise that that takes the pressure off those joints? Give them an, an alternative piece of equipment to use. For example, you know, if they struggle with weight bearing exercise, is it appropriate to put them on a put them on a bike, put them on a cross trainer? You know, rather than actually walking on a treadmill, would they be more comfortable on an alternative piece of kit? help them manage their pain levels and you're going to have that conversation with people constantly how does that feel what's what's the feedback you're getting from your clients get have that kind of open conversation two-way conversation with people um and get them to describe to you how they're feeling what the actual session feels like and from there you can tailor it you can modify it so that you give them exercise they're actually going to help them rather than hinder them Sure. I mean, I guess there's probably quite a fine line, isn't there? Once you start getting into sort of prescribing people, you know, medicines or or treatment or the work that physiotherapists do as well. So, do you have to be aware of your limitations on what you can advise? And yeah, of course. I mean, I, I for myself, I've done sort of various courses over the year. One of the first ones I did, having got my gym and PT qualifications, then go into something called GP referral. Okay, so actually work with special populations, people that are older adults, people with medical conditions, that kind of thing. But when, when we should never be frightened of actually referring people on as well. So if people say to you they've got a particular, you know, back back pain problem or problems with knee joints, whatever it might be, then we're fortunate that within our building we've got a physiotherapy practice that we we can refer people to. Okay. And that would be good sound practice in terms of being a, a good professional and actually knowing where the boundaries are in your in your field of personal training and not not being frightened of referring someone on um in the right situation as well 
Of course, of course. Okay. We've got a couple of minutes left. So if you've got any other burning questions that you want to ask any of our panelists, do get them in now. Um, so for those of you that aren't watching this live, so if you're watching this back on YouTube, if you have a question you really want to ask, if you type it into the comments section under the YouTube video, we do monitor them. So we will pick up on that one and we, we will try and get you an answer. Um, but if you're watching this live and you've got any questions now, do put them in. Um, this is what we call, this is part of our wrap up here really, it's what we call further reading and listening. So I asked our panelists to name any websites that perhaps they'd want to direct people to or or any podcast so nick you came up with a few for me but michelle first of all do you just want to tell us what would someone find on the simspa website what how why might that be of use yeah absolutely um so on our website we um have got a careers guide um which breaks down the kind of sector and industry so at simspa we've looked at kind of four core industry so it's exercise and fitness leisure operations community sport um elite sport and then we've also got education so it's looking at kind of in those sectors what roles there are so if you're just interested in having a look at kind of the different kind of sector industries and what roles are available um there's also what we call our professional standards so at sims where we've looked at every single role in the sports sector so from personal trainer to lifeguard swimming teacher to Pilates instructor um, and they kind of break down the core aspects of that role so if you're really interested in personal training definitely recommend reading the personal training um, professional standard it literally breaks down kind of what is expected of that role so if you was to go into a job interview you would know <laughs> what what that already kind of what that role is entitled um, we've also got a, a jobs board so loads of careers on there um and then also there's a bit about kind of our local skills work so if you're interested in kind of getting involved or hearing more then there's kind of a page on there for Hertfordshire so yeah contact me <laughs> for sure okay so have a look at that Simsville website there's QR codes underneath this is the this is the very heights of my technical competency I can put a QR code on there but in theory you should be able to take a picture of the one that's beneath the the relevant logo there and that take you directly through to the respective um web page Nick, do you want to tell us a little bit about the YMCA Fit website and, of course, the Hertfordshire Sports Village one? Yeah, sure, Gareth. Yeah, so uh, the, the reason for my putting YMCA Fit, there are lots of a, a well-renowned training provider who, who actually I started my fitness journey with all those years ago with my level two fitness instructor as my first step. They, they offer lots of um, training opportunities and courses. Um, in my own experience, a very good training provider, learn absolutely loads and good opportunity for you to network, meet other like-minded instructors uh, while we were learning to train. So, um, yeah, really good provider. And then, of course, um, our own Hertfordshire Sports Village, um, information on courses there as well. The, the courses that we offer, we offer a level two gym instructor course here, uh, which we've done for several years now. There's also some information on um, PT bios as well. So, our personal trainers have put their biographies up onto the website so prospective clients can log in, go to the relevant section and actually read about our trainers, what their specialisms are and, and decide for themselves who might be a good fit for them to take them forward on their, um, on their PT journey, really. Sure. OK, thank you. And then you also, Nick, you give me a couple of examples of podcasts that people may be interested in as well. Indeed, yeah. So these these are ones that I listen to quite regularly. There's there's everything on there from the, the from BBC Sounds uh, for fitness sake. There's um, articles on nutrition. There's our articles on how to keep clients, how to build a personal training business, um, keeping up to date with new trends in the industry as well. Okay, that's obviously key as well. Keeping up to date with um, things that are, that are happening in the industry. Um, so I always try and tune in, and they, they happen about once a month. Uh, so it's not a big time commitment, but it's always good to keep up to date with um, what's happening in the industry. For sure. OK, now, thank you. I'm going to leave those up there for, for a minute or so. I asked for more questions. and I've had two more questions come in, so we'll get through those. And I think that's probably us done then. So, look, Chris, let me ask you this question. Can you be a personal trainer and a physiotherapist? You can be, yes. Um, but I think physiotherapy pays better. Um, you know, and I, and I think both for physiotherapy and personal trainer, there's a couple of important additional things that the students need to consider is, A, having the correct level of insurance policy. 
because to operate as a as an independent PT, you need the correct level of insurance. You also need to consider um, a safeguarding qualification um, that is relatively inexpensive at about twenty five thirty pounds, um, and having um, a first aid qualification because you might find you running your sessions out. In, in, in a park somewhere and you are the first aider so there, it's not just about doing the, the PT aspect so you know for all of these roles insurance risk assessment safeguarding and first aid are an important wraparound of, of, of the career. Sure I mean because we, we've covered physiotherapy as a topic on here a couple of times so that you know, the videos are available to watch so if you're thinking about being a physiotherapist do have a look back through our library and i'll show you that one there's a there'll be a couple of videos on there that'll be useful so my understanding is that physiotherapists it's you know it's, it's very a very prescriptive route really to become that which almost certainly is going to involve going to university and, and getting the degree so presumably if you're sort of thinking about two you should probably focus on that physio route because it's I think, slightly longer um, one yeah, a lot of physios, as they're doing their three or four year course, will probably become a a, Pete, a, a personal trainer and mm -hmm. will do that alongside their studies. It is how it's been in the past and that's how f friends of mine have qualified. Sure. OK. All right. That sounds sounds, sounds sound advice. Um, Nick, and then the other question that's come in, and I'm sure you, might, you, you spoke about clients when they have to cancel last minute. Now, yes. presumably it happens the other way around. So the question is, what do you do if you need to cancel on a client? And, and how would you tell them? So let me frame this in two ways. So one, perhaps one of your team who's working as, you know, as part of the team in the leisure centre, but equally that personal trader that's out on the road by themselves and possibly arranging yeah. sessions privately. Um, so, so how would you recommend someone go about that process? It's probably quite an awkward call to have to make, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is for sure. Um, I can say sort of hand on heart, I've had to do it very few times over the years, but sometimes illness and things like that are unavoidable. You just have to, again, give as much notice as possible, be upfront and, and actually tell that person what's going on. Um, and then, of course, you know, the, the ultimate thing is to reschedule that session as soon as possible, get it back in the diary as soon as you can after you need to cancel, really. For sure. Okay, now that makes sense. Yeah. You can also make the session a little bit longer and give them some more time if you've inconvenienced them. So as a, as a, as a gesture of goodwill and in order to keep the client happy with you, you just give them a couple of freebies is, is, is the way friends of mine go about that. Sure. Yeah, for okay. sure. Yeah. Smooth, smooth the way, anything to, um, to help that process. Yeah, for sure. Makes sense. Okay, look on this. There is one more question that's that's come in. It's coming from Ellie, and her question is: Let me go to Michelle with this one first of all. How much do you need to know about people's nutrition and nutritional advice when you're working with them? Yeah, good question. Um, definitely important. I, I assume Nick, it probably comes up quite a lot. Um, yeah. There's kind of that um, saying that it's 80% what you eat and 20% um, being physically active. So you can't go eat, eating McDonald's, unfortunately, and then go for a run and and think it's all going to be okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah, right. so yeah, it's, de <laughs> it's definitely a big part um, of it. So, but also what I would say is, um, like Nick said, if if you haven't got all the the knowledge, then either take CPD. So um, again, at Simsra, we've got kind of a directory of Simsra endorsed courses that, that you can check out if you want to kind of add that CPD on. Um, uh, educate yourself. There's lots out there now. There's podcasts, there's YouTube that you could probably kind of look up and educate yourself if you haven't just got that um, advice there yet. Or refer, like we said, it's about being honest. And if you haven't got all that knowledge, but you can refer to somebody within the organisation or you've got a colleague that's probably got a bit more knowledge, then probably just say, oh, do you mind having a chat or get, getting some advice just while you build yourself up? I think something with PT is it is a lot of it you you learn as you go and don't be afraid and don't be kind of thinking that you're going to have all the knowledge on day one. It's something that you you build up as as you develop and grow within the role. Um, so definitely needed, um, but probably if you was going to be a specific nutrition new nutritionist, then you probably need a bit more. So maybe maybe some CPD and things like that. Um, Nick, would you agree? You're probably you're yeah, so hopefully absolutely. <laughs> yeah def definitely agree Michelle you, you learn as you go you're going to make some mistakes but hey th that's how you learn you know I've, I've made plenty of mistakes over the years but you you talk to colleagues you talk to people who have got more experience in the field of nutrition if that's the requirement 
um, and, and it's all out there. It's very, very accessible now these days. There's lots of information available through podcasts, through YouTube, through webinars, and it, and and you never you never stop learning. It, it, there's always new things you can learn, um, and you know you can always bring that to the table. New ideas, new training techniques. You know, make the session more interesting for your clients because ultimately, that's what's going to help build your business. Be, be you know, be a bit different. Sure. Okay. And I presume Dick, that's one of the benefits of working in a team as a personal trainer that you probably find that you've got you've got colleagues who really specialise in particular areas who are the, your, your go tos for kind of nutrition yeah. and you know, other ones that specialise in other areas. Yeah, of course. Yeah, you know, there are people that are more kind of sports specific. There are people more in the strength and conditioning field. There are people that want to work with people that just want to work for their health and fitness to lose weight. Is is what we're going to see a lot of clients coming to us for. So you're, you know, you're honest and open. You try and direct people from their initial inquiry, try and direct them to the right person for them. Sure. OK, I keep going to close this down. Then I get another really good question come in. I've had another really good question come in. Um, so it's um, what do you suggest to a client who wants to take protein supplements or shakes but doesn't have lots of money? And are there any good brands that are good for you? And then perhaps I'm, I'm intrigued by that question because perhaps what I would ask is, we hear all these fads and you get all these perhaps yeah. brands that are promoted that are probably really really expensive um yeah. and i suppose how do you know as well whether a brand just because lots of people are talking about it and because it's expensive yeah. doesn't necessarily mean it's better than something you could get for a lot less absolutely you know and my advice and i've always been quite firm on this from, from when i started is is not to brand or recommend any of them to be honest because you can get, especially when you're starting out, you can get all your nutritional needs from good, sound carbohydrates, proteins, and good fats. Don't don't waste your money. You know, spend the money you would spend on protein powders and shakes. Actually, put that money into a good, all well-rounded shopping bill. Get all of your good starchy carbohydrates, good lean sources of protein, hydration. Put that into the supermarket. Don't don't waste it on protein powders. For sure. OK, good advice. And sounds like that's probably really good advice that your team um, have to give out as well. Right. I am going to shut the door now on any more questions because we've had, we've had so many really, really good ones and we do need to wrap up. Um, so just finally, as I'm closing, for those of you that are watching live, if there's anything that you've really benefited from, so if there's any sort of particular advice that you've got that's going to be really useful for you, or perhaps if you've got any feedback about, um, about this webinar, if I could ask you just to type that in, because we really appreciate that feedback and we're always looking for um, endorsements so that when we promote future webinars on different subjects, we've got those. We won't use your names in any of those endorsements, so don't worry about that. But yeah, anything you found really useful or that you'd recommend these webinars to, um, to friends from other schools, please do let us know now. Um, so before I close, I just want to make you aware, again, of the HOP website. Uh, those are our social media channels. That QR code on that screen at the moment, that would take you through to our virtual encounter section on the HOP web page. And there are, so I think, 76 or 77 of these webinars at the moment across a whole range of different topics. So we've spoken about physiotherapy today. So we've actually done two sessions on physiotherapy there's one there on sports coaching if you want to look at something completely different we've done ones on you know bricklaying um last week we did one on set and prop design if you want to go and work in the film and me tv and media production industry next week we're doing one for web designers so there's something on there for everyone so please do have a look at that section of the hot website and please do share it with your friends and with your teachers as well we want them to know about it um, as well so in concluding then, I want to thank firstly all the audience that are watching this, particularly those of you that have watched it live and have submitted some really, really good questions today. That's definitely really added to the webinar. But most particularly, let me thank my three panellists for coming on and sharing their knowledge and experience with you today. So to Chris, Michelle and to Nick, thanks ever so much for giving up your time. Really, really appreciate you being on. My um, pleasure. And we hope that it, all of you watching this at the moment will be um, perhaps sending your CVs through to Nick and working with him, or as part of the yeah. industry, part of the, of, the, of the empire that Michelle and Chris are part of in Hertfordshire. And we wish you all the very best. Thank you.